if one has parents, let's say, who are quote unquote slowing down a bit, um, and they're talking a little bit about some aches and pains, and there, and there's a stairwell in the house, for instance, and they're starting to say things like, you know, at some point we're either going to have to move into a place that doesn't have a stairwell, or put one of those chair lifts oh, things, terrible. or, <laughs> or, um, or maybe just move into the downstairs. Mm-hmm. Do you think that? In just thinking about that, they're going to accelerate their um, their well, the demise of their locomotor yeah, ability. I do actually. Um, I think that when we start entertaining these negative thoughts and evaluating ourselves, we're always going to find evidence. You know, as you get older, you start. Oh my God, am I forgetful? So you. You pay attention each time you forget, and that makes it even worse. When I said to my students uh, in, in this health class, smart kids at Harvard, this is on uh, Thursday. I teach Tuesday and Thursday. I said, what was the last thing I said in class on Tuesday? Nobody remembers. I said, you must be getting dementia. You know. <laughs> All right. So that when a young person forgets, mm-hmm. it's okay. They don't pay any attention mm-hmm. to the forgetting. As you get older and you forget, mm-hmm. you, you get less involved in what you're doing. Mm-hmm. If you're trying to learn something, you have the competing uh, part of you saying, you know, that you're not going to remember this and so on. And, and uh, independent of all of this, I think a lot of the loss in memory has nothing to do with memory. You know, uh, there. when I was young, uh, and you're introducing me to people, I thought it was important for me to remember their names. Andrew, I know, doesn't speak well of me. I don't really care. You're going to introduce me to five of you. What do I care? If I'm going to need their names, chances are yeah, I will meet them again, right? So afterwards, if you say to me, remember Jim, and I say to you, which one was Jim? It wasn't that I forgot. To forget means I had to have learned it in the first place. And so if you don't learn it in the first place because you don't care, because your your um, values uh, change as you get older, then it's not a matter of forgetting when you don't know it in the second place. Um, and I think that, you know, if we turn it around, because now I'm doing this because I know you expect it of me, and we say, what if you remembered everything? Everything. Oh, that'd be I mean, terrible. How would you get through, you know, yeah, you, you wouldn't get to experience anything new. Um, so forgetting, you know, uh, serves a purpose. And, um, I used to think, I never tested this, and now I came up with this years ago, and I think it's probably wrong, but it's kind of fun, that people, as they get older, they become hard of hearing. But it also happens that the older you get, the more you realize nobody is really saying anything. <laughs> and so being hard of hearing protects you from a lot of that um, mm-hmm. you know, noise. Yeah, my grandfather used to just turn off turn his hearing. Off. Yeah. You know, I started where I've, I've always... Um, had glasses for reading at night when my eyes would get fatigued or, or something. But recently I, I came to my awareness that my vision at a distance is very, very sharp. I'm like an eagle. I can, you know, read numbers for, you know, yeah. uh, you know, very far away. But uh, vision, my vision up close has been um, diminishing. I find mm. myself straining a bit more even the day. So I started wearing, you know, uh, or eyeglasses. Or you should have the book further away. Or I should have you... the book further away. But, you know, I've just have defaulted to eyeglasses. And then, um, but I realized that because I, understand the the neuroplasticity of the visual system that I'm certainly accelerating the demise of my near vision yeah. um, by wearing glasses. And so I'm trying to, you know, balance the two. Well, do you know our vision study? This is kind of fun. So I'm in the doctor's office and like everybody else, I'm given the Snelling eye chart. Mm-hmm. The letter is, the, the, the Snelling is the letters exactly. and numbers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, but I'm different from most people. And I resent that the letters are getting smaller and smaller Mm -hmm. because it's creating an expectation that soon I won't be able to see. So I ask, what would happen if the letters got larger and larger? Which would be to change the expectation that soon I will be able to see. Mm -hmm. So when we do that, people are able to see what they weren't able to see before. Now, most of us have trouble around two-thirds of the way down the chart. Mm -hmm. So... Um, what we did was start the chart a third of the way down. Mm-hmm. So the letters are smaller than on top. Um, so now two-thirds of the way down that starting point, the letters are really small. And what happens is, again, people can see what they couldn't see before. 
awesome. Yeah. So the idea that your vision has to get worse, um, I don't, uh, I think there are many, many instances where that's not the case. But also, the whole test of vision is bizarre. How often in your life are you looking at letters that make no sense? You know, if I don't want to see you, I'm going to see you a lot sooner be able to run away from you. If I'm hungry, I can see the restaurant mm -hmm. sign mm -hmm. um, much quicker than if mm -hmm. I'm not hungry. I see things in color that are different in black and white, right. you know, so on and so forth. And to lose all of that with a two-dimensional uh, eye test seems to me... And again, you know, we haven't touched on this, but it's probably important with respect to vision. It's true with everything. You know, um, in fact, I tell people you're wearing glasses. Um, try it without glasses. You want to see when you can see and when you can't see. With almost everything, um, we again um, hold things still when they're varying. Now, what I mean by this is that, let's say with vision, my guess is that um, 11 o'clock in the morning, my vision is better than at 7 o'clock at night. The data, uh, yes. Okay. I, yeah. I mean, it'd be hard for it not. So what does this say? This says maybe I should either have uh, uh, a nap I don't nap, so I should have an energy bar. And even an energy bar is cute. It's just a candy bar. But you call it an energy bar, you're allowed to eat it. It's like you take a piece of cake, put it in a muffin tin. It's called a muffin. It's healthier than the piece of cake. Anyway, <laughs> all that, be that as it may. Um, that control, a, um, a great amount of control over our physical well-being comes about by attention to variability, which is just a fancy way of talking about mindfulness. Mindfulness is noticing change. That's what it means to be variable. All right, so if you took your glasses off and you saw for yourself, what are the times, what are the moments that you're having? I'm not talking about people who are you know, almost blind, um, where I can't see and when I can see. And then you ask yourself why. And then it may be the case that um, it's a particular font or more likely that you're tired and then you have other options. But once you start wearing them, it's like taking a laxative. You know, take a laxative once, it's fine. If you're taking a laxative all the time, you're teaching your body to depend on the laxative. You can teach ourselves by some of these... Uh, um, uh, things that are supposed to be helpful, then we teach ourselves to, to need them in ways we otherwise wouldn't. And so we did this attention to symptom variability with big diseases. So when you have a chronic illness, first, the way most people understand chronic illness is that there's nothing that can be done about it. Yeah, the word chronic implies that. Exactly. But all it means is the medical world doesn't have a fix. It doesn't mean there's nothing can be done. Now, you have your symptoms with the chronic illness. The presumption most of the time, I would think, is that the symptoms are going to stay the same or get worse. Nothing only moves in one direction. Sometimes it's a little better, sometimes a little, you know, the stock market, it's going up. It doesn't go up in a straight line, it goes up, down a little, up, you know, and so on. All right. So when it's better, why is it better? So we do this, um, we call people periodically, and we simply ask them, how is the symptom now? Is it better or worse than the last time we called, and why? Several things happen. The first, by engaging in the whole process, people feel less helpless, and that turns out to be good for your health. Second, once you start noticing that now it's a little better, it can even be a little worse. You feel better because you thought that it was, you know, always maximally. I'm always mm -hmm. in pain. I'm always stressed, whatever it is. Third, or whatever I'm up to, um, by asking the question, why now is it better or worse than before? You engage in a mindful search. And I have decades of evidence that that mindfulness itself, the neurons are firing, that itself is good for your health. And then finally, I believe you're more likely to find a solution if you're looking for one. 
So we've done this with multiple sclerosis, chronic pain, uh, Parkinson's, stroke, biggies, and in each case have very positive results. And the good thing about these sorts of things is that there are no negative side effects. And it doesn't mean that you have to stop doing any uh, medical procedures you may be doing. But you know, you're asking, you're back in charge of your own health care. Why does this hurt now? You know, stress. There are some people who think they're stressed all the time. Nobody has anything all the time. So I call you, um, Andrew, and I say, how stressed are you now and why? And we go through this over time. And then you find out, you know, you're stressed when you're talking to Ellen Langer. Well, then the solution is easy. Don't talk to me. <laughs>